Hey, greetings. Hello. I, hmm, shoot, Gil is connecting. I had trouble with my audio in Zoom on my last call, and I am not hearing you, but it's very likely my problem, not yours. Let me just see when Gil gets in, if I can hear him. If not, I've got to reboot my machine and come back. Nice to meet you. I'm, I'm, I'm Jerry. Hey, Jerry, you can't hear me? And I'm not hearing a word. Gil, do you hear me? Yes, but I don't see you, but I, I hear, I I hear, hear you, you both. I hear you and Craig. I don't hear a soul. So my Zoom is not happy. No. Uh -huh. da, da, da. Oh, that Where nobody has souls. I now hear people. That's great. I'm back. <coughs> Do you and hear you live see people? Us, Jerry? <laughs> I see live people. They don't know they're alive. But <laughs> Kevin, you got a haircut. I did. I did. I get one like every six weeks for my daughter. It's kind of a, a you know, and then it bushes out. You but, know. Your, but your chin is resisting, Kevin. What's that? Your chin is resisting. My chin is resisting. Yeah, I have the, this thing I do myself on my chin. It's a little grate and a rake or whatever it is. A little beard comb. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a thing on top of a razor that is a thing. Oh, okay. Or is it like a leaf blower? Uh, well, I use a mower. Maybe it's like a leaf blower. A leaf blower could give you that, give you that wow. Like, yeah, kind of can use That'd be good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no one's, no Ken, one has noticed. Ken just rubbed up against a bear. You did. Yeah. It's looking less, less feral. <laughs> is that the right it word, is. feral? That was yeah, perfect. Yeah, no, word, no. Jerry. Was, you you yeah. look far less unabomber today, Ken, really. Yeah. <laughs> You know, my wife kept saying, you look like Ted Kaczynski, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Is this what I miss when I don't come really early and beard talk? <laughs> no, no, usually there's no beard talk Well, you know, all. if you grow oh, one, you could, you could get a lot of this, you know. <laughs> yeah, we don't usually engage in beard talk. <laughs> right. Well, we did one. You had um, one. Cool. Nice in, to see everybody showing up. You know that OGM really stands for Obscure Grooming Methods. <laughs> oh nice, nice. wow that's a that's a nice pun that's, that's, that's that was good ken how did you not do that first uh oh ken just froze oh i haven't had i haven't been drinking coffee is the problem you know it's just herbal teas so my brain is yeah. oh, okay. in the morning because herbal teas will get you or they won't they will I'm trying to get my, there we go, tile window to right. I'm trying to get my Mattermost chat up next to the Oh, yeah, Zoom. the Mattermost. That's so, where is that? Yeah. Oh, the well, we're trying to make our chat persistent. Cool. What's going on um, there? George, are you in Texas? What's going on where? Behind my, no, in New York. It uh, looks like Texas. Oh, yeah. What a mess in Texas. Yep. <laughs> what a dangerous, dangerous mess. Ted Cruz mm -hmm. is in Mexico, so. Uh, isn't that funny? <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> Perfect. It's a, you know, it's a multiple mess because, you know, the physical circumstances is an obvious mess. You know, people in Dallas without electricity, water, or sewer pretty messy but then the story is such a mess you know the immediate claims from fox etc that it's because of wind power yeah right just bizarre and you know it's actually because texas decided fuck everybody else we can do our own grid 
And well, then and then they cool. they deregulated the grid, which lowered the cost of power, which means they spend less on infrastructure, so all of it can break. And they didn't and they didn't buy the cold weather package for their wind generators. And their exactly. generators were running fine. You know, when they left the showroom, they didn't get the thing on the bottom that they you know whatever. It's a little bit like it's a little bit like the seven three seven the Boeing seven three seven Max, mm. where they made the sensor that would tell you if the two sensors, they made the warning light that would tell you if the two sensors weren't working an added feature that you had to buy. Mm. Wow. Just completely nuts, completely and totally off the charts. So there's, there's that you know, profound deep incompetence at one level, but then the, you know, the, the, the rush to tell the propaganda story. Right. Well, I'm in New York and uh, mm -hmm. we get much worse than Texas. I had to go out and buy a $20,000 generator mm -hmm. a few years ago. And we we're on the regular power grid. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think there's a little something wrong with that reasoning. Mm -hmm. Well, I think some places know how to deal with, with snow and bad weather and some places don't. Well, I had to drive should, from, but it doesn't. <laughs> I had to drive from Connecticut to Boston after a blizzard many, many years ago in my first career as a tech industry analyst. And uh, the Connecticut Pike was miserable, and I did like a two, three sixties on the freeway, just trying to get up to the, the Mass Pike. The moment I crossed onto the Mass Pike, it was like, oh, mm -hmm. this is what a road's supposed to be like. Same blizzard, same blizzard. It's just that Massachusetts knew what to do, at least in that day. Exactly. It, it was interesting, so how the conversation converged, right? Because Tucker Carlson made this big statement about windmills. Uh, the governor, uh, Abbott, made the comment on windmills. And then it started to get really technical. So instead of uh, having you know, uh, arguments, the explanation was there's water in the gas, which causes uh, gas pipelines to freeze up. Uh, even nuclear power plants haven't been winterized. So all of a sudden, uh, there is just raw data uh, coming out to, to make the arguments. And I think that really is how we have to move forward here. And is mm -hmm. that, I mean, is, does anybody have a feeling that, that that's working? Because I, I watched Tucker's clip on YouTube about uh, Texas is 100% wind power and therefore wind is terrible, therefore the Green New Deal is a miserable thing. And I'm like, how- So how we learned how to do that uh, from Trump or because of Trump. I'm saying he and, used and the, same, then the same tactic. It's the same, it's the same thing. 30% of the country believes Tucker Carlson and 60% believes, you know, the reality. Reverend Davidson, you have their in? own confirmation bias and fit it into whatever they believe. Neil. We've got aging networks. They're complicated. They're engineered. They're linear. They try to connect them. In Australia, they had a major problem in 2016 with a, a big storm that blew through. Two tornadoes came through South Australia. They blamed the wind turbines because, Austra because South Australia had a progressive government that was going down a renewable energy pathway. It's complicated because the energy grid is designed to carry the constant loads that come from the spinning loads of coal and gas and various other powered fire station, uh, uh, power stations. But the renewable load is more variable. The mm -hmm. issue was in that case that the uh, wind turbines had a tripping mechanism that when the rest of the system went down, they were more finely tuned to go down faster not to preserve the wind turbine, to preserve the network. And so they were better risk managers. Mm -hmm. When the system went down because the power lines came down, major power pylons collapsed, mm -hmm. right? Not the wind turbines. The wind turbines turned off, not because they couldn't run, mm -hmm. but because the system, the grid was insufficient to cope with what they would be able to provide. And so the inquiry is more complex because it does get technical, but the political blame game will, will always be played on who has the vested interests. As an outsider watching what's happened, Texas has got a separate grid system not connected to the main, major grid deliberately to favour those people who benefit from power generation. Mm -hmm. Every power grid in the world, in countries that aren't progressive enough to recognise we're in the middle of collapse, uh, is not doing anything to maintain it because the people that reap the benefits, the oligarchy that gets the money, uh, don't want to maintain the small pumps and the diesel motors and the kick-in generators and things to actually prop up the system maintenance, not the actual grid. They don't care about the grid, but if the system maintenance doesn't work, 
then the, the thing collapses. So the first thing to do is point the finger at the newcomer, not at the others. Now in Australia, Elon Musk then stepped in and provided the world's biggest battery. Um, and the South Australian grid runs much more stably than the other states uh, and is getting close to 80% uh, uh, you know, wind generation on some days. Hmm. So to watch this again, <coughs> it is deliberate propaganda to favour vested interests and generally to try and take advantage of the fact that it's too technical for a typical punter to understand. And by the way, we haven't got power and we haven't got water and we haven't got gas. And there's a multitude of OGME angles on this, this whole thing. Yes. Um, um, maybe chief among them or high on that list on my list is how do you convince policymakers around these thorny sort of pretty technical issues? How do you get policymakers to make better policy? you know, just pretty simply in that sense. Um, anyway, um, I, can I just reflect, even though Tucker was sort of our entry into this conversation and he's kind of a proxy for Trump, can I just say how nice it is to wake up in the mornings and not be thinking top of mind what what awful thing Trump did on that day? It's like, I'm, I'm breathing easier. My, my soul feels a little lighter. Yesterday they imploded the Trump the, the Trump Plaza in mm. Atlantic City. And there was something metaphorically just healing about that. I don't know. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, so let's go through a, a check-in round. I'll, I'll uh, bring us in and we'll talk about what kinds of OGME things are happening in our lives. It's perfectly fine to pass if you uh, don't wanna uh, step in. Uh, so let's go Klaus, Scott, Judy. Okay, first. Um, yeah, this has been this has been an amazing um, an amazing week because the conversations are finally shifting into evidence and science space. Um, I got uh, uh, a really interesting invitation to a conversation. I'm just putting the link on there um, where the the statement to it really is that. Uh, after the election, it is becoming obvious that the division will uh, continue and that we will continue to stalemate. And so how can a democracy survive when one group is so violently opposed to the changes that the other group feels are existential and necessary? And that seems to be, um, and, and to keep to keep uh, uh, the peace uh, in the process you know, of, uh, of making all these changes. And I think that's the conversation we're having forward, uh, going forward. Um, I'm working on um, another Kiss the Ground webinar with the, which will be hosted by uh, the president of the Sierra Club this time. And the focus is completely on what next? What are we going to do next here? And uh, put uh, a thing in here because there, there is this, 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 this time requires uh, a level of civic engagement and, uh, and participation that we haven't been used to. Um, uh, yeah, I will repost it on the matter most link, yeah. So anyway, uh, we, um, the, the, the discussions, particularly in the NGO world, need to be consolidated. We need to come on a common platform because we are neutralizing each other with so many little sidekicks and, and, and uh, excursions into topics that are, that are important, but they're not really timely at this point uh, to change the discussion and move us forward collectively. I think this is an amazingly dangerous time, uh, which will be shaping our future in a profound way. And I think it's we are in the middle of this vortex right now. Love that. Thanks, Klaus. Um, oops. Let's go, Scott, Judy, Neal. Hey, everyone. Uh, no video today, but you all remember what I look like. Um, <laughs> so the, the thought that I had this morning you had to remind us, didn't you? You had yes, to remind us. Yes, I had to. I had to. Um, I was thinking about where I went wrong with my thinking skills program. And 
it was hard to discern, but I, I realized that it was as soon as I started thinking about selling it, that was what, that was the blocker. So once you start thinking about selling something, then you're thinking about what do I need to do to change it, to make it more sellable? And what I realized is that I need to make it more shareable first. Once I get to the point where it's actually shareable with another person, then sellable can come later. Mm. And shareable means that I have figured it out for myself and I've, I've been true to my vision and that I've you know, incorporated the wonderful feedback I've gotten from others. But that if I don't get to the point of being shareable, the value is only for me. Now, there's a lot of value. I've, I've really enjoyed where I've come to with this, but if no one else can receive it, then I haven't done anything. So I, I realized I put, as soon as I took the sellable off the table, I realized that I feel uh, much lighter about it and it's just, uh, it's just great. So that's where I am. Love that, Scott. George, go ahead. I just want to make a comment on what Scott said. Scott, can I offer you a reframing of that rather than take selling it off the table? I think it might be a good idea to put it back on the table with by thinking about how do you make something more valuable? So I always think about selling it in the, in the framework of I want to create maximum value. Selling to me is only helping people make the best decision possible by making my product the best possible product. So just offer that, offer you that to think about. I appreciate that, George. Thank you. I think my, my, I, I agree with that. And and what I'm trying to do now is to make. Uh, maybe it's a, a more a greater distinction here. Making selling the second step instead of trying to make that the first step. And, wow. and I, yeah, but thank you all. That's fine. And, I, and I think that what you're bringing up, Scott and George, is a, a really interesting piece of, of our journey together, which is what is the new set of business models and platforms? How do we, uh, how, one of the questions that's active for me is how do we make a profit while minding and improving the commons mm -hmm. instead of while mining and sequestering the commons? So I have a I have a the start of an essay called Mind Don't Mine, uh, and trying to figure out you know how that how that plays out because because the general if you're an entrepreneur the general first thing is how do I lock it down how do I make a profit how do I sell it and Scott I think your instinct is really like very OGM -y. it's like okay how do I how do I propagate it how do I share it then how then what's the business model that folds around that <clears throat> uh, and George I think your your reframing is uh, is trying to get some sensitivity around those issues. And I think part of what we can do together is figure out some of that language and, and you know, how does this work? What happens? Um, Judy Neal Angel. Um, I've been pretty busy this past week on diversity issues, working on some things with the university as well as with other groups in town. There was a really excellent annual diversity meeting for the biomedical engineering department at the U of M. It was a two hour program with first hour being an overview of all of the different actions that they have underway and the groups that people can participate in. The second hour was a panel of nine university professors, um, BIPOC in character um, from across the country talking about their universities and personal experiences and that kind of thing. I thought it was a really excellent diversity initiative framing for a much larger community. Sounds awesome, thank you. Um, Neil Angel Vincent. Lovely to see you all again. Sorry for hey. dropping in and out uh, on different occasions with the timing. Um, been having ongoing discussions with uh, Phelan uh, Grantia, who uh, I met in this uh, uh, forum here. So it just happens to overlap with this time, a lot of the time. Um, I'm calling in from Belgium. Uh, I have recovered from the whiplash of sliding on 
the slipperiest ground I've ever uh, encountered with frozen frozen ground when I wasn't expecting it. Um, luckily, it didn't do any damage to my spine, but stretched all the muscles in my neck and took about three days, four days for it to come good again. So that was a bit of a, a, bit of a bummer, literally, but it could have been worse. Um, I know how to dodge the white bits. I didn't know how to dodge the brown bits. I thought the brown bits would be less slippery, but I was wrong. Black ice. Um, so the other thing I've been doing with my partner, Anne, here in Belgium and uh, partner in Australia, uh, David Jago, looking very deeply at our individual and collective callings around social ecological collapse and how do we show up in the world and the, uh, uh, the, the business enterprise that we're playing with here is called And Now What? Now that we know this, and now what? And so the beautiful alignment between um, David's work with the technology participation facilitation processes and Anne's work in, in trauma and healing and psychology and mine in dancing around systems and zooming in and zooming out and being able to see them from different perspectives. And so after about a year of really deep conversations with Anne during lockdown, um, and the reason I'm here is that I joined Anne from Australia watching the collapse that was happening there. Um, and so how do we now align our gifts in ways that make a difference? And David's framework from the technology participation is a lot around being, and there's five elements, being aware, being comprehensive, being affirmative, being ethical, and being courageous. And each of these forces us to look into the abyss and actually say, where are we at when we face the potential finitude of myself <clears throat> and the potential finitude of humanity? And now what? How do I show up? So that's the stuff we've been playing with in the last uh, few months. And it's not as doom and gloomy as it might seem. It actually ends up coming out the other side as how do we share comprehensive compassion? How do we regenerate what we can? How do we bring human stewardship to landscape and to community? Uh, all of the elements that I think are very ogm -y in this space, we just take a different starting point of facing reality and then living the questions. So nice to see you all here. Thanks. Oh, lovely. Thank you. And don't, don't feel guilty about dropping and dropping out. Uh, it's, we're all here when we're here and we're all here at the right time. It's sort of like uh, open space, like whoever shows up was meant to show up. <clears throat> and I love that. Um, and Angel is a new friend. So um, can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you fine. And, and you know oh, what the problem yeah. was? Uh, I had the mute on my computer and had forgotten about it. So that, oh, yeah, yeah that's good. Good. Well, uh, thank you for welcoming into this space, everybody. I, um, I've been listening to your uh, meeting and I'm just so impressed. I mean, I've, I, I, I listened to two meetings and I, I felt like I, I got an Oxford education. Um, so just uh, uh, thank you so much for the work you do and, and for just uh, showing up to these conversations. Um, you, I've, only, I've only seen two of them and I'm already, I feel connected to you. Um, I, uh, I'm a healing centered educator. Uh, so there's some connections with what Neil just said and uh, Sister Where is she? Sister Judith. Um, I do a lot of work around diversity, equity, and inclusion from a healing-centered perspective. I just finished my doctorate at Columbia a Teachers College in curriculum and design. I'm also a contemplative scientist, so I'm not just studying the impact of contemplative practice and meditation, but actually using contemplative practice and meditation to conduct research. So, um, and, I'm a, and I'm an entrepreneur as well, so I'm just excited to, to be uh, support whenever I can make it and, and, to, and to be part of this community. Um, I'll put I'll put the link to to my website in the in the um, yeah thank you Jill I'll put my website in the uh, in the chat so you can kind of get to know me a little better um, but I'm I'm right there in terms of thinking about collective trauma uh, collective healing and 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 really curious about intergenerational healing in, in particular so excited to be a, a thought partner and uh, thank you for welcoming me awesome Angel thank you thank you very much um, very fun. Uh, let's go, Kevin and Vincent Doug. Can I just add one quick thing uh, to to Angel? Love love the fact that you you mentioned the contemplative practice and the contemplative space, um, because that capacity to go to the still point, beyond the analysis, uh, is critical to tap into the embodied, intuitive knowing, beyond the knowledge, uh, and that's where the wisdom is coming through. It's the it's the conduit. Uh, for us, it's the conduit that is so true 
that we now can stand up with the courage of our convictions because how can you argue with this because you're feeling it too so mm -hmm. love it thanks mate Beautiful. yeah thank you awesome hmm. mr jones yeah hi um <clears throat> the, our community equity fund i mentioned uh it, it, we've got our first uh, public presentation of it at a canadian faith-based economy thing monday with the slides will be done friday etc i'm doing a uh a, a clubhouse good pitch tomorrow at seven o'clock uh that should be kind of fun uh if you guys are on clubhouse i've stumbled into the blockchain this seven, past week seven eastern kevin or seven where uh, seven eastern yeah yeah uh and i stumbled into the blockchain one there was a indigenous friend is concerned because a lot of uh sovereign indigenous nations are being approached by big folks in the digital currency blockchain thing that want a sovereign economy and they're afraid of the kind of deals these big rich folks want to do with somebody with sovereign territory mm -hmm. and so we've got p engaged but we've got somebody who's building a blockchain for food security for the Choctaw in Oklahoma and somebody's built it for a land registry for a, <clears throat> a Colombian tribe to keep them safe from you know extractive industries and then locally there's a global uh, infrastructure play called resource that's on the cello platform that seems the team is actually based here and, and they were trying to get me to introduce them to local merchants associations. And I said, you guys are ready to talk to blockchain geeks. You're not ready to talk to main street merchant, you know? And so I'm working with them on, on that. And some other people are coming in to help them, uh, but they're getting a bunch of money. in. so it's like, I don't really know what the blockchain is, but I'm around it all of a sudden. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm, you know, and, and there's local economy stuff. I think it can be helpful with and that I think could be pretty interesting. So anyway, it's, it's, you know, I'm, I'm real comfortable in new areas where I don't know what's going on and it's new and, and I bring something that other people don't have. So it's a, it's a familiar level of confusion that, uh, that I like. So. Love that, Kevin. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, let's go Vincent, Doug, Lauren. Hi, everyone. Um, the last week has been <laughs> quite um, rich in conversation. Uh, I've spent a lot of time in uh, different uh, clubhouse rooms and also in different discord rooms um, part of me is like exploding to kind of like write and continue those conversations and part of me just wants to like stop talking and just actually do things because I've started to kind of see like the same rooms pop up and talk about the same things and I'm feeling more like it's like a cafe and less like people actually having the tools to be able to do coordinated action um, one quote though, that really resonated with me this week, um, is that I came across from Danella Meadows. Um, there's one leverage point that is even higher than changing a paradigm. That is to keep oneself unattached in the arena of paradigms, to stay flexible, to realize that no paradigm is true, that everyone, including the one that sweetly shapes your own worldview is a tremendously limited understanding of an immense and amazing universe that is far beyond human comprehension. It is to get at a gut level, the paradigm that there are paradigms and to see that as itself a paradigm and to regard that full realization as devastatingly funny. That's sweet. So yeah, I've been also feeling like existing in different paradigms and, and reading that uh, actually helped me a lot um, try to kind of come to terms with it and not try to like figure out which one was the the real paradigm um, like for example like listening to a lot of thinkers that are like super fervent that we need to create a completely new parallel economic system and then other people who want to create like you know more incremental stakeholder capitalism and how do those two fit together um, so those have been my thoughts this week Thanks, everyone. That's awesome, Vincent. Thank you. Um, love that. Just so much in there. Um, Doug, Julian Bentley. Well, I find myself uh, not knowing how I want to start talking this morning. Uh, the world is pretty complicated. And uh, our brains probably feel a little bit like scrambled eggs. Uh, I'm going to focus in on two things. One is I uh, work with a group of economists 
who have a fair amount of political power. And what's striking to me is how they are desperately holding on to the growth model uh, with the view that if things go right for them, assets will not have to be reevaluated. But I think it's just a, a pie in the sky. It just can't happen. Uh, so the uh, part of, well, it's been a fascinating dialogue and I'm beginning to make inroads into this group, uh, which actually comes down to around 300 people uh, to have a dialogue about what are the actual facts about what we can do. Uh, so for example, the idea that we can, uh, the Gates new model in his book, that we can uh, kind of start serious efforts five years from now and be done by 2035 or 2050. Uh, while meanwhile, the world is falling apart around us and they're not paying any attention. So that's, you can imagine all the group dynamics. Uh, it's fun for me because I'm respected and accepted in the group at the highest level. And, uh, but at the same time to feel powerless is pretty amazing. That's great. Uh, the other thing Sorry. that I'm, that I'm working that. on is a book called Garden World Politics. And the premise is that it's easier to solve several problems at the same time rather than one at a time, because if you do one at a time, they're gonna end up conflicting with each other and you don't wanna go down that path. So I've picked the two key human needs, uh, or actually the three. Uh, one is for food, one is for habitat, and the third is for culture to hold it together. And that's what needs to be worked on. The, uh, I'm so struck by how many photographs on the internet of agricultural projects show lots of plants, but no people. Yep. Uh, the people are moved out uh, in order to make room for agribusiness. And we just don't wanna go down that path. It's much easier to do something like the Italian hill towns where you have a small population fairly concentrated in an attractive, pretty place, and you can walk in minutes to the land that's feeding you, uh, either to this forest or to work that land. So uh, I'm having a lot of fun working on this book. It leads me to all sorts of stuff. For example, the Greeks have the view that uh, friendship is the basis for politics. I thought that was an amazing idea. And that's people who move out of the family into relationships across family boundaries and begin to relate to each other that would develop an interest which becomes the basis of politics. And it goes, okay, I, first I have to learn to reflect on myself. Then like Socrates, to how to be in dialogue with another person. And then in the polis, the town, when a series of conversations are in the same place. Thinking like that, I find amazingly useful. And there's a lot of it, and we don't read it very much. Okay. I mean, for example, the, the path from Marx to Nietzsche. Who, who here can be articulate about what that path was like and what it means for us? Uh, anyway, that's the kind of stuff I'm spending my time on. Uh, it's challenging maybe to put it strategically at a time when most uh, scenarios of high, pro have high probability of failure, it's important to look for scenarios of low probability that could possibly work. And so I'm betting on Garden World. It gives me something to do. Um, before passing it to Klaus real quick, I just wanted to insert, I'm fascinated with the transition into industrial society. and. Uh, there's a, uh, I just put a link to the Charter of the Forest. I don't know if anybody's heard of it, but the Magna Carta mm -hmm. has a parallel document called the Charter of the Forest, mm -hmm. uh, which basically gives people, this is when enclosure movements are starting, people are being moved off the land, land is being turned over to sheep grazing, and people used to live like raindrops on the land. Uh, and they used to, that's how they fed themselves. And so what the Charter of the Forest does is it includes includes a whole bunch of easements, which have a special name, but they're basically certain specific rights. So widows can graze their pigs in the king's forest. Mm -hmm. 
right? Just widows, not everybody. You, can, you can't just go willy-nilly graze your pigs in there, but, but a certain category of people are allowed to do this thing uh, with land that has now been kind of roped off for the king to go hunting every now and then, et cetera, et cetera. And so there's lots of, lots of interesting ways that this all plays out. Sorry, Klaus, go ahead. Yeah, that, to the first part of what you were talking about with the economists, and by the way, I, uh, you are working on some fascinating topics. It's, it's really appreciate what you were saying. In, in other conversations, it seems that we have reached a stage of collective cognitive dissonance where an entire population group is rejecting reality. You know, there, there are phases of adjusting to co cognitive dissonance when reality diverges from what we want it to be. Um, and we have maybe 30% or so in particular decision makers who absolutely reject the idea for example, that we have to exit fossil fuels. And you can see that in the discussions in Texas, that's basically an expression of cognitive dissonance. It's going to get a whole lot worse because so far the conversation around agriculture and the food system has been strenuously avoided. And once that comes into play, the disruptions that are being caught that will be necessary to shift into regenerative practices equal the disruptions in the energy sector. So the idea that we can continue uh, 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 on this economic path is completely, it, it's impossible. So, so how to then uh, guide you know, a group that is, that is screaming and kicking uh, into a different path, uh, how, do, how do you, how do you um, communicate you know, the need for these significant changes in ways that doesn't lead to a collective uh, collision here and, and a lot mm -hmm. of breakage? That's really, I think, is the challenge. Yeah, and the fact that these policies affect so many humans in so many ways. The re repercussions are just so gigantic. Um, let's go Julian Bentley-John. So uh, have a quick check in, but I wanted to say, uh, Lauren, until you put your hood down, you were so covered up, you looked like a Tuscan Raider. <clears throat> uh, so my check in this week is uh, last weekend, I managed to import the SIGGRAPH 2003 proceedings into Neo4j, uh, which is an important step. I haven't done the other years yet because SIGGRAPH basically changes their data model every year. So I have to come up with some kind of generalization. Uh, once this is done though, it gives a, coordinated knowledge base for what SIGGRAPH is doing, which means pretty much all of the high end of uh, computer graphics. Uh, let's see. And then for what Tug and Klaus were just talking about, I wanted to bring up a professor at Berkeley who was studying par farming practices in Central America. And one of the really interesting things that struck me was he uh, was talking to one village where they grew what agribusiness called weeds in between the rows of maize. And the agribusiness people came in, they wanted to take out the weeds and the people in the village said, but then what will the donkeys eat? So they had without the ben so-called benefits of agribusiness achieved a balance in, in their local ecology. And I'll try and dig up who this is because it was some years ago, I read this in the alumni magazine. Okay. Thanks, Julian. Um, Bentley, John Ingrid. Hey everybody, hopefully you can hear me okay. Yes using a different setup. Um, yes, so you, look, I'm in, you look more high tech than usual. <laughs> I'm in Texas. Uh, so several, many of our neighbors are without power, many without water, many with bursted pipes, somehow having enough heat in their house to still flood their house, even though it's freezing. Anyways, we've been really lucky. Uh, we have power and good water and relatives staying with us. Um, so that's, that's where my mind is right now. Um, I do love hearing everything about the agriculture and stuff uh, that the previous conversations. And then I'm still very much focused on the uh, group decision making process. So we're talking about, you know, how do we bring these people to understand the situation we're in and, and move together as, as a full community rather than just separate coalitions often in opposing things. So that's kind of what my evidence-based um, decision-making process um, is for. So it's building bot 
I've kind of mentioned it a few times uh, that I'm uh, hiring researchers and marketers to start make it be kind of like a Snopes, but for much more complicated decisions than what this person said um, and more evidence-based and mathematical. So um, that's kind of what I'm working on and then looking for contract work to fund my OGME pursuits. Um, and I got a couple leads, so hopefully something Yay. like that. Oh, that's good. Do you want yeah. to post a link to the Gullibot uh, in the chat? Yeah, yeah, and I'll turn my video off, um, but I am listening and appreciate everyone's participation in this. Sweet, thank you. And you reminded me that we sent an invite to, uh, to a Zoom conversation about the Reunited States documentary, which, yeah. is, which is very much about sort of how do we get back into conversations that bridge this cultural divide, which is a huge and important issue. So uh, yeah. went ahead there. Uh, yes, I will repost it. Go ahead, Neil. Are we doing Mattermost or are we doing Zoom uh, or both? Right now we're doing Mattermost. Uh, that call is a call with the Flux, with April's Flux community plus OGM. So we'll be in normal, normal Zoom, normal Zoom chat for that one. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. I just wanted to say Bentley, go, go well in Texas. Yeah. And while you're there, pay really deep attention to where your vulnerabilities are, right? Because don't just take it for granted that you're gonna have good friends and good food and good water and good heating and everything else. These storms are coming. These are the storms of our grandchildren coming early. And the heat yeah. storms and the cold storms are going to get worse. And people are going to be lost. And smart people like you on the ground are going to be critical to how do we actually uh, try and become more anti-fragile rather than brutal. Go well, brother. Awesome. Um, thank you. John Ingrid George. Hello. <clears throat> So this is just a footnote. I, I think probably many of you heard about this, and it's not a it's not a, something that would we would immediately say, uh, oh yes, that's a solution. No, it's more like, oh, this is a little side door that's opening up and probably going to be misused, but we should know about it. And it's the the uh, action of Nevada to basically enable uh, the kind of public private corporation you know set up that created uh, Disney World. And their thinking is, you know, that they'd like to attract, the, they'd like the Teslas and the Googles of the world to come in and not just do, not just create jobs, but to create whole infrastructures, you know, places, to, you know, basically what we're talking about, places to live, um, management of resources, culture, et cetera, et cetera, and, and not have to deal with the thicket of uh, state regulation. So, you know, I'd be interested in seeing what, what Google would come up with, but I, you know, I don't think any of us would, would just sign up. <laughs> I think we'd say, you know, all right, what are you gonna do with that? And, and maybe the fact that that door is opening for a Google means that that door could be open for a, um, a different kind of entity, uh, the kind of entity that we would uh, come up with. John, there was a piece that flew by, I think, yesterday about um, multiple billionaires and corporations trying to start new cities, new communities, new mini nations. Yeah. Similar to what you're talking about. Uh, lots of discussion in the article about the technological whiz bang of it. No discussion that I can share about governance and democracy. Right. I mean, there's, there's a couple of, uh, you, you know, there's this strong libertarian group that like the seasteaders and the the people who basically say let's let's get away from all government and all taxes by the way and you know then and then we'll just run everything on free market and cooperative principles and it'll work just fine um you know sure go try it uh, don't <laughs> don't ask me for too much contribution the more interesting stuff i mean actually the um what happened in celebration in, in florida was more complicated uh and the transition from the private to the public was was more complicated, but it they did think about that. They did think about, wait a minute, wait a minute, this is a public entity, this is a city, and it, it's gonna start out very disnified, and it's gonna get less disnified. And and how do we do that? And um, so they were that was the right question. They don't have the solution yet, but 
that's a that's an area where uh, maybe they need some OGM type help to come up with that solution. We did some talking about pattern languages and developing an OGM pattern language, which kind of stalled a little ways for actually pretty interesting reasons, because we were developing a special purpose wiki to, to build that out. But um, I, I, I'm reminded of that because of the original pattern language, which was the Portland Pattern Repository, but also a pattern language, which was all about how do we design cities uh, and, and houses fit together in a way. And, a pattern language is an example of what I call design from mm -hmm. trust. So uh, I've met a couple of architects in my life uh, where we discovered that their MO is when they meet a new client, they hand them the book, mm -hmm. Pattern Language. And they say, would you just please browse this? If you like this, we can ah, work together. That's good. Mm. It's super, super yeah. interesting and very different from conventional approaches. So I'm, I'm wondering how pattern languages can become a, a, a better ingrained part of policy planning, development, the kinds of things that you're talking about so that we avoid the smart city that looks like Disney right. and is like an, an urban paradise designed for robots. You've seen the, the two follow-on pattern languages, I'm assuming, Jerry, the one, the, the group the group process one that I actually worked on and then uh, the one that Tom Atlee's uh, worked, worked on, you know, so. The wise, wise democracy yeah. pattern language. I will put a link to pattern languages in the yeah. chat. Yeah, totally. I'm a huge fan and I would love for us to curate mm. one uh, together. Go ahead, Neil. Just wanted to link, if I could, what, what Gil was saying with what John was saying. We need whole systems design laboratories and whole system design has to include governance and it has to recognize current culture and it has to recognize coming collapse because there's no point in designing the wrong things writer for the wrong situations like Texas at the moment. And there's no point in pretending that if we do the technology right, then the governance will follow. It doesn't. So you've got to say, how do we do this? Then we need to find the places mm. where we can actually trial this. And every country town, every island in the world uh, is a potential experimental site. Cities, I think, are too big and too messy but every country town recognizes at least a level of mateship and interdependence and every island knows they've got physical limits and unless we start with that level of system consciousness mm. frankly we're screwed mm. thank you um ingrid george ken so um i've really been thinking a lot lately about what's going on with bitcoin because i um you know my sort of uh economist mind uh, really discounted it when it first came out and when it went up and down and up and down. And now it's getting real traction as an actual repository for banks and um, investors in a way that it hasn't before. And I'm wondering what this means because I think it's got a lot more to do with, with um, something going on in the economy that we are not aware of probably um I, i'm just trying to think about what is happening here because it just doesn't make sense in a lot of ways and who is the winner in this besides you know some guy who can mine this and also thinking about what an incredible energy suck this is and how destructive it is to the climate no one really talks about that and and yeah what kind of scheme is happening here i'm, I'm just really interested in in what this means because I think it's a huge shift now. I think it's not going away like we thought it was. I mean, even the, uh, what's the new one, Dogecoin or something that was a joke has now suddenly taken on a, a life as well. So just something that very strange is happening and uh, not quite sure what to make of it. So I'd love to hear sort of what the group thinks about this. Very, it's very Andy Warhol-esque. Um, I met a guy long time ago uh, at the push at Cecily Summers push conference in Minneapolis. Uh, and he gave a speech where he brought a squeegee onto the stage. <clears throat> and he said, uh, this is a squeegee I used to use in Andy Warhol's factory where I was silk screening. And he said, I would come in and I'm gonna make up what the story was, but I would come in in the morning at the end of the night shift and everybody would have just finished making <clears throat> um, t-shirts using this silk screen and this pattern and this squeegee. And the t-shirts we would sell for 10 bucks. 
And I would start producing basically on canvas, same squeegee, same artwork, same whatever, um, paintings that we would sell for 5,000 bucks or I'm making up a number. I don't think they could make 5,000, but it was like a way higher number. And the whole thing was an exercise in, as, as Warhol did a lot in his life, like uh, the value of culture, attention, the, the complete discrepancy in actual value to perceived value, all that kind of stuff. And it's almost as if uh, the, 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 it's almost as if the ridiculous coins are playing with our perceptions of value, which the dollar is also, right? It's like, it's like we don't really recognize that the dollar is an act of faith. You can't go exchange it for, for an ounce of gold. You know, 20 bucks won't get you an ounce of gold at the bank uh, and haven't since Nixon and a bunch of other strange things about money. And then I think there's a lot of people who are pretty way smart on money in this call uh, and money systems, but um, the whole thing is requires willing suspension of disbelief. Have you spell bubble? What? Yeah, but I'm saying, but it's now it's a paradigm shift though mm -hmm. from, uh, we all know money is a made up construct completely, but now it's shifting into something completely different with Bitcoin. I think the big, the well, big game change, <clears throat> go ahead. A big game changer was uh, the uh, um, Elon Musk putting $1.5 billion exactly. into Bitcoin. I mean, I just made a fortune on on a completely unexpected amount of money on on cryptocurrencies. Uh, but, uh, it's, it, it was it just exploded. The the reason why, in my mind, uh, uh, Elon Musk did this and and why Bitcoin is running is because the United States has abused its currency uh, control to such a point across across the planet that um, there is a, an enormous pushback. And the European Union, uh, Russia, China ha have been working on undermining this control of basing sanctions, uh, uh, unilateral sanctions by the US and other countries. So now you have, uh, and there has been an attempt to uh, to put the, the euro onto a blockchain, for example, so to, to use, uh, to use these control mechanisms uh, to to uh, to be able to track money, make money transparent, uh, because there is so much uh, uh, bad stuff happening in in uh, money being extracted from third world countries that ends up you now in London and so on. So there is a this is a reflection of a much deeper power shift uh, that is currently underway and. At the losing end is going to be the U.S. dollar or the control of the United States to con to control the global currencies. It is in my mind. And to add to add two interesting things to the mix, um, there's this thing called modern monetary theory, which has eaten everybody every economist's brain, which I do not comprehend. But it basically says, "Hey, the U.S. prints the world's reserve currency, so it can sort of just print it willy nilly forever and invent money and not worry about that." And I'm like. This just sounds like a disaster brewing, you know, as, uh, as Taleb says, the turkey thinks every day is great until like the last day when the turkey doesn't have a great day. Well, uh, and then, same, same, same with Bitcoin, Jerry. Yeah. Um, um, take, well, take, Bitcoin is... Take a, little time, take a little time to look into modern monetary theory. It sounds crazy, but there's some real provocative thinking there that's worth looking at. I think there is. I haven't found an angle in. I'd love to, I'd love for anybody to offer me a handle on it that doesn't make me bounce. Okay, uh, I'll send you. I'll send you some. I'll, I'll try to dig up some links on that. Uh, the author of the main book on modern modern monetary theory is a senior advisor to the chairman of the Senate Banking Committee. So I totally get that. And she's like, there's a whole bunch of famous people who yeah. who've bought who've like bought this, and I'm not buying somehow. Um, and then the second thing I wanted to put in was zero marginal cost economy. So the idea that there is a whole bunch of stuff we can now get for free. Mm -hmm. Like I don't pay Google anything for Google suites and Google maps and a whole bunch of things that actually make my life, my life better. Now there's the whole, if you're not paying for the product, you are the product sort of conversation mm -hmm. also. But as things start to go to, to no marginal cost to deliver, we, st we start stepping out of an economy mm -hmm. where money matters as much. And there's a possibility here of stepping into very sustainable, very interesting worlds where we get fed, where we have housing and the exchange of money for value is different, categorically different. 
And I don't, I don't know enough to paint that picture, but I think that a hundred years from now, that may look really plausible. And today that may look like a really far-fetched thing, but we're all so obsessed about money and is Bitcoin money. Like my mom passed away recently, but I, I could not convince her that people were paying real US dollars for Bitcoin and therefore it had value of some sort. She was like, no, don't buy it. It doesn't exist. Uh, anybody else want to jump in? Yeah, John. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> this is, I won't go into it because it's too long a subject, but, and Doug can probably do this better than I can because of his uh, INET. But it isn't just, oh, we can borrow anything and it doesn't matter. I mean, there actually are some numbers that they use, they, you know, and it isn't, it isn't the total debt. It, the total debt in relation to GNP is a real parameter, but the other, the other ones uh, are uh, the, the pre-inflation indicators, uh, you know, and the ripple effects in different uh, credit markets. So it's not a completely made up thing. And actually, I'm sorry about the sirens going by That's here. That's okay. It's, uh, a, it's not a completely made up thing. And actually, I have more faith in modern monetary theory than I do in Bitcoin, but that could be, it, it has something to do with the, the uh, shared ledger, if you will, which is, you know, what a blockchain is, the shared ledger of indicators about whether it's in trouble. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because the indicators that say Bitcoin in trouble, you know, are not shared. They're, they're all private. So, you know, we'll just really, wake up one morning and they'll be back. It, it would you know. be really interesting to run a poll where we put a list of things like Bitcoin, MMT, and so forth, and say, okay, like rank these in the order in which you have confidence in them. Uh, that'd be right. something to do. Well, it's Go got to be a temporary hedge for where to put your um, currency because it can't it can't go on because the other currencies aren't out of they're not done yet. The U.S. dollar is not done yet. It will come back, but it's very interesting to see this shift. It's all funky, Pete and Gil. Just one other question. Oh, go ahead. John. Watch out for the. I mean, I think the zero margin stuff. It, uh, and the guy who came out with that book, I'm blocking on his name right now. I mean, it's, it's a very good thought experiment. It's very good to, to think about that, to point that out. As you point out, it's not actually, it's not actually zero cost. It's not actually zero margin. And the little bit of cost um, is real and needs to be figured in. And also there are some irreducibles. I mean, this whole dematerialization thing pushes digital goods to zero margin and that leaves the the atoms like the food and the truck bringing the guys bringing the food to your house and the house itself i mean there's these certain irreducible you know, difficult things that are left and um you know you, you have to be sensitive to the the, the where are the limits of the metaphor mm -hmm. Yeah. That's all. Uh, I would say. Are those irreducible that. things like real things? Yeah, <laughs> I thought so. Good. Yeah. <laughs> Pete and Gil. Um, uh, I'm I'm super, I'm I'm interested, I guess, or or something. Uh, I I have uh, some knowledge and thinking about Bitcoin um, that I'd like to share in a in a longer conversation. Um, Ingrid, I love your viewpoint. Um, and I would be interested in having kind of like a Q&A uh, session an, an hour some sometime maybe next week or something like that. Um, so I'll set that up and, and get it on the on the mailing list. Thank you. Um, I'm also I've got an explainer like explain Bitcoin to me like I was seven years old. I've got a, a, a write up like that I just started. So um, I, in, incidentally, so I'm going to share that uh, in the chat here too. I'm just rem rem reminiscing on the Bitcoin mining server you brought to our party long ago. Uh, it's like, oh, okay, anybody can go do this. This is cool. Um, Gil, go ahead. Yeah, Pete, thanks for those last two things. I appreciate that. Um, uh, I would love to have a deeper discussion about this. Uh, I've always tried really hard to distinguish between blockchain technology and Bitcoin y you know, artifacts of, of, of wealth transfer. And I think people get confused about the two of them. They're very different. In my mind, Klaus, congratulations on making a lot of money on that. You only were able to do that because other people came in and bought Bitcoin at a very high price, assuming it's going to keep going higher forever. Uh, so, you know, there's a Ponzi aspect to this thing. Um, <coughs> uh, um, what's the other thought? Uh, uh, as we move to zero marginal cost, and I think telecom is one great example of that. Remember when you, you know, you would call, you would call your relatives when you had flown to their city because you didn't want to incurred in, in toll charges on the telephone and that's now you know if the friction is gone real stuff is very different 
Um, but to the question of, of, of money and the dollar and the collapse and all that, you know, the, what John said about the relationship of debt and the GDP is critically important. Dalio talks about this a lot, about the relationship of money to the rise of actual productivity in a society. And I would suggest people take a look at Peter Zihan. I put his name, I think, in the, in the chat, uh, in the Zoom chat, sorry, I didn't put it over on the other side, who is a uh, geopolitical strategist uh, who sees a much rosier future for the United States compared to the rest of the world, given land resources, demographics, and other issues that we don't usually pay a lot of attention to. And it's very, it's provocative and challenging and very different than the way a lot of us have been talking about the future that we're facing. Um, he sees a strong US, not a collapsing US. In fact, he's collapsing China uh, within the next generation. So make of it what you will, but take a look. There's a bunch of videos out there. Interesting, thanks Gil. Um, I just wanna take the beginning of what you said where I convinced myself some years ago that um, investors, uh, speculators, Mm -hmm. do not want stability. They do not want a nice stable economy. They must have volatility and they'll do anything they can to provoke volatility. Mm -hmm. So the global financial crisis in 2008 is fabulous because somebody invents an instrument too opaque, too obscure to figure out. Mm -hmm. A few people jump into it, then everybody jumps into it. And then if you're not invested in, you know, uh, in these, in these uh, derivatives, um, you're going to be fired from your position. So they get the world's money to get poured into this thing. And then (laughs) And the first people off the off the merry-go-round profit handsomely. They do really well. The key is to get off this off the thing before it busts. So I don't think the whole bunch of people are investing in Bitcoin because they think it's going to go up forever or Dogecoin or whatever. I think they're catching emotion. And I think this is all a lesson for us on you know, the madness of crowds, the you know, emotional swings, and how that translates into weird temporary shifts in value that had little to nothing to do with actual value created on the ground for humans. Yeah, it's not just the madness of crowds, it's the manipulation of crowds, as you're saying. That too, totally. Yeah, and so, you know, look at GameStop. And as, we, modern, and as we consider, modern. you know, the, dis, the, the disappearing marginal costs, look at, what is it, $50 trillion of, of, wealth, of wealth movement over the last year, from the most of us to the few of us. Huge capital shifts. Uh, and that's part of the story too, because in that case, money translates to power. Yep, yep. Uh, George Ken Lauren. Hi. Um, yeah, I think the Bitcoin thing is more about psychology than about economics, mm-hmm. um, which is arguably a branch of psychology. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Hazel glad Henderson glad to say that glad to see that Ingrid agreed with that. I thought I was getting some slack from Ingrid. From, you know, from Ingrid That's a great that. one-liner. <laughs> yeah, we like it. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, speaking of psychology, I am a big um, fire aim ready guy. Um, and uh, I, so I, uh, I've been working, as I mentioned before, this thing called the Mind Skills Playbook, which is a book or in some form, it's not going to be a book actually, it's going to be more a live web thing, um, to explicate mental effectiveness methods in thinking, feeling, imagination, uh, memory, and and, and doing, not just thought, uh, not just thinking, and certainly not just cognitive. but so there are going to be a lot of methods, and I th- recently found that the me- methods can be templated so that you know youngsters can who are learning to do this stuff anywhere from kindergarten th- through eighty can um, call up a template quickly in Rome or whatever thought processor they're using. Call up a template, have a flexible outline from which a framework from which to work in a flexible way, not a, not a computer algorithm. But so anyway, I, I said, what the hell? And instead of working on it, I'm just going to put it up there. So I put it up last week. Hmm. It's, it's a mess. It's terrible. Uh, and it'll get better. You know? um, it's embarrassingly, um, unpretty, it's embarrassingly disorganized, 
and I'm going to put a link to it, but I warn you, strap in and put your helmet on and your, your goggles on um, because it's a mess. Uh, but I believe in dumping the mess down and then, okay, we'll figure out a way to clean it up and organize it. And then we'll figure out a way to make it pretty. Uh, so I'll put the, uh, the, um, the link to it in the chat. It, it's in there, the, the regular chat, I mean, the Zoom chat, sorry. Um, and I warn you, but uh, any, it, you're also able to, it's, it's the it's first as far as the Rome culture knows so far. It's the first live Rome book that's being put up there. Um, there are, are one or two Rome books, but this is the first one that's being put up and actually being written in front of you, mm -hmm. so you can watch it being written, uh, which has got the Rome community kind of excited, or some people in the Rome community pretty excited because they've never actually seen somebody write a book. And, mm -hmm. uh, and not only that, the readers of the book, you know, no friction, no, no joining anything, no fee, no nothing. The readers of the book can drop in paragraphs. Mm -hmm. that you, can, you can say, you know, George, you uh, had this template for um, diagnostic problem solving. We had this, uh, template for uh, handling an unwanted emotion, and you left out something between step six and seven. So we, I put in 6A, 6B, you know, and that kind of stuff. So it'll be a community effort and gradually get tuned up. So I don't have to, you know, publish how, it 101. How does, uh, how does Rome handle contributions like that? Because there's uh, GitHub, does fork and pull. Uh, and then there was this, there was a short-lived startup long ago called Mixed Ink, that was all about collaborative writing of, of documents. And what it did was it preserved the origin of each sentence, basically each chunk of text. You could say, "Oh, Ingrid put this in on this date," and it survived through all the drafts and edits and whatever, so that the, when you saw the final document, you could see who had contributed precisely. Yeah. That there are options. I you can give editing, like I'm. A, I'm part of another collaborative group on Rome where they had to put in my uh, email. So I can go in there now, make contributions and edit anything whatsoever, including other people's contributions. And so it's free form, open, all, all open. Mine is uh, anybody can get to it. Uh, I don't have to approve you. Anybody can make a, a, an edit and, or that is anybody can, can create a block, which is basically a paragraph, uh, and you can edit your own block. Uh, and then um, I can zap your block or edit your block as I wish. Um, so I have overall privileges, but, you know, so I, I've restricted it. And you can, you, there are a variety of ways to set it up. And part of Rome is I mean, they, they think it's a note-taking tool, but it's so far from that. It, it's a thought processor and it is being deliberately designed to be a collaborative thought processor so that all of us can get on there th with a given issue, all think about it and build the document or build the, not the document, it's actually, you know, it's a, it's a matrix of thought. It's not mm -hmm. a matrix, it's a web of thought, three-dimensional web of thought. Um, I, I mean, uh, someday I can, I can get on and do a demonstration of... Uh, I think we're getting overdue for a so kind of a, a share the tools kind of conversation where we could start with Rome and dig through and then go to neighboring tools and see what's up. Because, uh, yeah, I think... And I actually demonstrated to Jerry yeah. uh, Rome operating inside of the brain. In the notes field, basically, an embed of Rome. Which is, yeah, which is really an insane, wild, mind-blowing kind of thing. And, uh, but I think that uh, if you're not into thought processors, whatever, it, I don't think it matters what the thought processor is, as long as it basically conforms to your style. Uh, Jerry likes going in with visual first. I like going in with text first. It, there's no right or wrong. Uh, it's just what fits our brain and our preferences. 
and all that best. But if you're not using a thought processor now, uh, you, you're in for a 20 to 30 IQ point uh, increase. As, as crazy as that sounds, uh, anybody with a thought processor is, a thought processor is 20 IQ points higher. I want the 20 EQ point booster. So that that it, it can be used for that. It's not really just a thought processor. You can you can process emotions in it. You can process. That's kind of cool. I was just saying that jokingly, but now I'm like, what? What? No, you could re, you can any mental event. Yeah. Can be represented conceptually or by pictures or by some representation, and and put in a thought processor. Let's be more general than Rome. Can put it be put in a thought processor, and then you can say, ah, A and M. What's the connection? There seems that there's a connection between A and M. What's the connection? What's the relationship? How can I change that? Bringing creativity into it, and it's just interesting. Mind blowing. Cool, cool, cool. Thank you, um, Angel. I put a link to your webinar for this afternoon in the chat. I don't know if you want to put in a word about it or anything like that. Yeah, it's just uh, it's in the it's in the Mattermost chat, not the Zoom chat. Sorry. Um, and okay, I just thank you I, so I, much. Yeah. Um, do you want to say say anything about it? Just. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. I'm the I'm the sorry. My internet bit um, slow. I'm the director of the fellowship program at the Garrison Institute, and uh, we have eleven wonderful fellows. And part of that process, we invite distinguished scholars in the field to have conversations with us. We have our second a forum today at 3 p.m. Eastern time with Dr. Uh, Dan Siegel, who's an expert in interpersonal neurobiology, very interesting conception around um, what the mind is and, 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 and how that relates to mental health. Um, and I think it'll, um, it'll interest you. The topic is um, um, dispelling the lie of a separate self um, and his notion of intra-connection, not inter, but intra-connection. Uh, it's very interesting. So it'll be a really relaxed conversation and I'd love to have uh, you uh, there. I also will reserve seats for you for future uh, forum uh, events that may be a little more exclusive. Um, we'll be having one each month with exceptional and creative thinkers. Um, so uh, I'll be looking out for, your, for this community moving forward in terms of those events and, and I'll invite you there. Sweet, thank you, really appreciate it. Um, here's our cue now, uh, Ken, Lauren, Eric. Angel, will, uh, I, I've got a call at that time today. Will that be recorded so that we can have access to it later? Yeah, it will. You should register. Okay. Thank you. Sweet. Oh, man. <laughs> Coming late in the order here is so much that's gone forth before me. I'm not quite sure where to begin. Um, I read an interesting article in the Washington Post this week about extremist thinking and pandemics and how they've gone hand to hand throughout history. And um, it really, um, it wasn't, you know, a hugely in-depth article, but it, it gave me a, a real sense that I think Biden is focused in the right area. His number one priority is getting the pandemic under control. And that once that's under control, a lot of the extremist thinking is going to tank. So, um, because I, I was really like, man, things are just looking grim. And um, so that, that sort of lifted me up a little bit. I'm also pretty excited that, you know, roughly two hours from now, NASA starts its coverage of the Mars landing. I don't know if anybody's um, up on that, but you can go to YouTube, NASA channel on YouTube will have full coverage. So that's, you know, uh, I've been locked up in the house for a long time. So at least I get to explore Mars, you know? So uh, my ankle is about 95% better. I sprained it a couple weeks ago. Um, what else? Um, I've been listening to the book Cast, The Origins of Our Discontents. And I have to say, you know, I've done uh, a few deep dives in my life around um, uh, races, race and racism in the US. And this book is just, it's filling me with a lot of sorrow. Um, I just listened to the section yesterday on uh, uh, Germany and um, in the US, they were, they were in New Orleans, they wanted to take down a statue of Robert E. Lee and uh, a 
an anonymous donor came forth and said, I will cover the cost as long as I can remain anonymous. And they floated the idea and there was huge pushback. Um, people got really like, you take this statue down, there's gonna be real problems. They put bids out, no contractor would take the bid. No white contractor would take the bid. Um, one who did his fire, one of the trucks was firebombed, so he withdrew. It ended up being a, a, a black owned firm that, that came in and did it. And she compared that with Germany where, um, you know, the, the generals of the Civil War from the Confederacy lived out their lives in, um, uh, you know, what's his name? Um, Jefferson Davis got a, uh, a, a presidential library. And um, in Germany, there are no monuments to any of the Nazis. Um, William Westmoreland Jr., I think, um, came forth and, and said, you know, Rommel was a great general, but there are no memorials to Rommel. There's no statues of Rommel anywhere. And rather than memorialize Hitler, they paved over his bunker. Um, they decided to put up memorials to the people who were terrorized, who were, <clears throat> excuse me, who were the victims of the Nazi persecution. Uh, we're in America, you know, we celebrate the, the, uh, the oppressors. Um, and there was something about this particular chapter that just hit home that just how deep the racism is, particularly in the South. And the, the electoral map really kind of is very much the same today as it was uh, during the Civil War. There's just such a strong current of racism that um, it really makes me wonder, you know, can this be healed and, and how to heal it? Um, how, to, how to shift people out of this deep hatred that comes from Santok's perspective from the emu character of I'm better than you are and you're not, you don't deserve, right? So um, I don't have any answers to that. I'm just kind of sitting with that of, you know, it's, it's weighing heavily on me this week, this, this book. I've been enjoying this book for a while. It's a pretty thick book, um, but this particular piece just really hit home. And then uh, going back to what Jerry led with, uh, I am definitely, I don't wake up in the morning filled with anxiety of what am I gonna find out when I turn on my computer and look at the, the news today. So I'm just noticing a huge amount of gratitude for that, that something in me has relaxed a little bit um, and is feeling a lot more hopeful and, um, you know, there's such a low bar for Biden to, to come in and, and improve. And yet I think he's doing fantastically well. I love the story that, you know, at the town hall meeting, um, a woman was saying she had this problem. He said, I can't solve that. But I tell you what, if you hang out afterwards, you and I can talk and toss ideas around. It's like, oh, my God, humanity. I was just my heart was swelled up. There's humanity back in the White House. So, um so I, I'm balancing all these things. You know, I'm, I'm a little schizophrenic, but uh, that's what's going on for me this week. And dogs, yes, dogs. There's dogs back in the White House. There are dogs who actually aren't biting their owner either. So, <laughs> Thank you, Ken. That was marvelous. Um, Lauren, Eric, Craig. Hey, I just want to make an announcement that um, at Kiko Lab, which meets on Monday nights, it's 3 p.m., at Eastern time, um, we are going to be um, uh, moving forward on plans for a little grant writing flotilla. And so anyone who's interested in uh, raising money or championing a cause or has an entity, some kind of business entity that they would like to throw in the mix, we're gonna try to maximize um, the uh, the money that we can get as a community by being flexible about what how we organize stuff and matching ideas to um, organizations because each grant is very specific about what they what they need and you have to have an organization in this particular place and you have to meet all these uh, qualifications so we're trying to maximize the amount of um, grants that we could even uh, qualify for. So if anyone is interested in any way and um, being a part of that by either like uh, reading um, or writing or who hasn't an entity or uh, who has project management skills or um, can help us with a calendar, anything like that, I, I would love to talk to you. Awesome. Thank you, Lauren. 
Um, that sounds like a lot of fun. Great, uh, great thing. Did you put a link to it in the chat? In the uh, Mattermost chat? Yeah. Or... The Mattermost chat, the, the channel chat. named Calls is where much of our chat has been, not all of it. Uh, a bunch of it's still in the Zoom. Uh, thank you. Eric, Craig, Pete Gill. Yeah. Hey. Um, first of all, I would like to talk a bit about my information management hell I went through. <laughs> I have a, I have a problem with my eyes. Uh, for me, the bright light of a normal computer screen is difficult. So I bought uh, an obscure tablet called the Hisense Q5, and it's like a, it's like eating, but it's actually an RLCD, which is an LCD screen, so it has a better refresh rate. But it's made in China, so that means no Google Play Store. So I have to work through side loading apps, it's called. So you have to try to find other app stores that install things. And I was trying to, okay, what kind of app can work for me? And then I was comparing Dynalist, Workflowy, MindMeister, and Rome Research at the same time, trying to bring all my information oh my that God. I currently have from oh. one system into the other. <laughs> and like one system just seems to work, but then I, bump into this weird kind of bug in the in in the tablet that I have no idea what it has to do with <laughs> like just only today I fi finally finished and I I decided okay I'll, I'm gonna use and you never guess which one I'm gonna use MindMeister <laughs> no way <laughs> yeah the, the 400 year old app <laughs> But it's actually working quite well for me because cool. yeah, there's different reasons for it. But it's like, ah, oh, damn, such a hard thing on my brain. And it makes me overwhelmed for a couple of weeks now. Like it's, first of all, I thought this, this, this tablet is never gonna work. I brought it into the computer. They said, you, can, you can't install anything on it. But then I find a way to do it just by asking someone and wow, it's like a, it, but it, it so much depends on it. If I can manage my information, then I can continue the work that I'm doing. If I can't, then it's a problem. And if I'm mm -hmm. in front of the screen for a couple of hours, just my eyes start to hurt. So it's like, wow, what a what a search. <laughs> and then um, the other part is about how to get unstuck. I sent a screenshot. It's actually the, just a time. I would like to do calls uh, my idea was uh, Wednesdays, five o'clock C Central European time. And the screenshot that I shared is just so you can see what that means in your time zone. Um, and it's, yeah, I talked about it a few weeks ago that I wanted to do calls where we talk, like we have like small groups where we talk about where you are with your projects and stuff, where you get stuck, could be emotionally, could be practically, projects or information management skills or whatever and to advance stuff uh, i might work to the together with uh lauren uh but that was just an idea i had on monday so that's not i think concrete yet but i'd like to do weekly calls on that uh, just to help people advance wh where they get stuck will you post those to the ogm google group so that more people can see them the google group the the not the, the forum, group, but the Google. The ah. forum would be great too. Uh, the Google mm -hmm. group is probably the thing that has the broadest reach right now because uh, not okay. everybody, not everybody's in in uh, discourse and. Okay. And yeah, let's talk about it. But that that will give you the most, uh, you know, reach across the OGM community. I'll do that. Did cool. we ever think about a Facebook group, by the way? Um, I think I I think I created a Facebook group and we've never gone there. There's also a LinkedIn group that I created. We've never gone there. So I think mm. I think we have them, but I, I think our, our tendency is to to avoid those those spaces. Uh, it, okay. It's a conversation we ought to have. Again. Okay, cool. So, um, yeah. <laughs> cool. So is your information world less chaotic right now? Did you did you like get your arms around? Well, it it today I felt like mm -hmm. oh I can let go. I can kind of trust where I, where I ended up. It did some crazy moves. Yeah, but it 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 seems to work now. Yeah, <laughs> I love that. And and. And just your, your narrating your story made me realize that if the brain were to melt and die and go away, and if I weren't able to use my brain the way I've consistently used a single tool yeah. for 23 years, 
I would be hosed in a really bad way. It would be, mm-hmm. it would be a big disaster in my life, and we'd have to accelerate the Free Jury's Brain Project to actually like make a mm-hmm. make a, a, a platform or something. Something. Do they have a cr- do they have a cross platform uh, export, or is it just export? We 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 have an export of the data, so that my data wouldn't die. Um, it's just that editing and adding stuff. Like if the tool suddenly were to vanish, I couldn't actually curate it, uh, which is, which would be a uh, it would really throw a wrench in my works. Wow. Um, Craig Pete Gill. Hello, everyone. Uh, uh, thank you, Jerry, for inviting me here. Um, listen, I'm I'm enthralled. I'm honored, pleased to be here. Um, I found a community of uh, inspiring people, very much different to the community of friends that I have here. I, uh, I live in Thailand. I've been here for 20 years. I'm originally from Scotland. Um, so I was introduced to OGM only a week ago. Um, I've been attending or participating in Friday meetings with the Center for Humane Technology, which is based in San Francisco, many of you may know. Um, And the reason I've been doing that is that my project over the last couple of years has been the building of a social media and messaging and video calling platform. Hmm. So the the social issues which are inherent in that project and everything that I discuss with uh, uh, like-minded people on Fridays has filled me with uh, uh, renewed purpose. Like all of us that have been around for a few years, we've been through many things in life, right? Um, And I retired from the stress of Europe 20 years ago. I created a new stress, which lasted a couple of decades here in Thailand. And I started to relax again uh, a couple of years ago, but then I discovered this uh, uh, new technology for a peer-to-peer connection between browsers. Uh, it's called WebRTC, and I found it so fascinating. Did I say I'm a software developer? That's what I've been doing since the, the mid-80s. So a couple of years ago, I embarked on, uh, on developing a, a, an app, which, uh, which is online at comms.global. And that has filled me with, uh, uh, with interest and drive and uh, a purpose for the last couple of years. So living out here in Thailand, most of the, 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 the people I get to socialize with are uh, retired expats, not particularly take, most of them not particularly taking life very seriously anymore. So I do lots of uh, uh, motorcycle riding and a bit of fishing and a lot of work spend a lot of time with my family. This community that I've just been introduced to here is, uh, is so inspiring. I look forward very much to uh, getting to know uh, many of you as time goes by. I'm sure that uh, you will all be able to help me find the secret sauce that my project needs to uh, differentiate itself from, from all the others. Awesome, Craig. Thank you. I'm glad you're here. Um, WebRTC is ultra cool. There's a whole bunch of platforms that have been, you know, using it, harnessing it to do stuff. Mm, yeah. um, Comms Global isn't resolving for me. I'm getting a, uh, I'm not getting a website there. Is that the right? Uh, HTTPS the right comms, comms dot Global. I haven't let I right. type it in here. I think the problem is if you do HTTP, it doesn't actually resolve. It should. So I just. I just typed in comms.global and I got nothing. <clears throat> now I get a site can't, really? can't be reached. Uh, comms.global unexpectedly closed the connection is what I get. Anybody else getting it okay? Maybe it's me? I get the same as Jerry. Oh, except I typed HTTPS, comms.global works fine. It just worked fine. C-O-M-M-S? Uh, no, no, 1M. 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 Oh, heck, sorry. Sorry about that. Totally blew it. Um, cool. Thank you. That solves that problem. Uh, let's go to Pete then Gill. Um, 
I'm going to do something crazy. I've got a, a couple topics I want to cover, and I'm I'm going to hit return on a on a message in the Mattermost chat. <laughs> what I'm going to cover, um, uh, because I feel time pressure, I'm going to go breadth first and not very much depth. And please feel free to ping me. Um, so uh, one of the things I this this week on OGM, um, some of us have been doing some background work on. OGM as a structure, structuring OGM, how would that work? Um, and I, one of the things I used to say was OGM is a verb. And uh, I've got a little essay I, I, I want to write. I haven't yet um, called OGM as a fractal, um, uh, which I'm excited about. Um, uh, in the Mattermost, by the way, if you go over to the public channels on the left and, and look down at the bottom of the channel list you've got, there's a, a, a link that says more. I think it's a link. Uh, if you click that, there's a bunch of channels um, that are in the Mattermost that you can join if, if you're interested. Some of them are OGM, some of them are Kikolab, some of them are wild and free. Um, one of those is tools and technology, and that's where I've been talking about things like Roam or Obsidian or Stroll. Um, uh, I realized recently that uh, you could actually do multiplayer Obsidian, um, more or less. It's going to be a little bit clunky, but um, with a, a shared uh, folder. Um, so the the tech I, I so I talk about this in that channel, but um, uh, I've been thinking of using Nextcloud as a web dev file server, and then having more than one person uh, doing Obsidian, kind of like a wiki. Um, this is kind of an experimental thing. Um, uh, Bill Anderson and some of one or two other folks we we play with tech. So I don't think this is going to be a, a solution, but I think it's going to be almost a solution. So I'm kind of interested in in playing with that. Um, uh, I come in and out of of uh, this thing uh, publishing with Sphinx and Markdown and Git. Um, there's a there's a cool pattern which I I see in open source communities and I haven't seen elsewhere because it doesn't make as much sense elsewhere. But um, if you have manual like content, uh, content that looks like a software manual, um, I was I was uh, thinking about writing a guide to OGM, for instance, um, and it would work well as, as kind of a book structure. Um, it turns out Mark Trexler with his climate web and SiteBrain has, has used SiteBrain, which creates little microsites out of uh, the brain. Um, he's ganged those together into essentially books. Um, he's doing it a different way with uh, the old site brain, which uses Pelican as a single site uh, static site generator. Um, we're talking about leveling up. Um, and I'm also got some other projects that we worked on uh, that I'm working on, where instead of Pelican as a static site generator use Sphinx. Um, and Sphinx usually talks restructured text, but it turns out that it's also easy to do it with Markdown. It also turns out I was really surprised to find Sphinx just runs perfectly, chef's kiss, um, with Docker. Uh, you don't actually have to install Sphinx to use it. So um, a whole nother set of things that I would love to write up and, and talk to somebody about that probably isn't interesting to most people, but it's super cool. Um, and someday I'm going to have more, more and more people writing with Markdown and Git. Um, uh, I wanted to flag a couple things in the world. Um, uh, Zainab uh, Tufekci uh, wrote a really good essay on orality versus uh, um, oral kinds of communication as opposed to written kinds of communication. And she, one of the things she notes in there as a byproduct of the conversation is oral communication is sometimes written and written communication is sometimes spoken. So oral communication is kind of what you get on Twitter, even though it's written. And written communication is kind of what you get as a news speaker is dictating words off, the, off of a teleprompter um, reading the, the news to you. But anyway, there's. Um, uh, this is something I've been fascinated about, the, the subject I've been really excited about for like 20 or 30 years. Um, written culture is this weird thing that has, has only lasted for a few hundreds of years. And it's not the way people think. It's not the way people act. It's not. It's, it's going to be this weird blip uh, in history. And I think we're going to get back to oral culture. Um, uh, because that's the way humans work and brains work and stuff like that. Maybe there's going to be a fork where we'll have oral culture and AI aided um, written culture. Um, she, she 
covers some stuff because she thinks a lot about um, privilege and things like that. Um, written conversation has a bunch of of stuff where uh, it it's it's exclusive. You actually have to learn how to do written culture to participate in written culture, whereas oral culture is just something that you're born with. Your your brain works that way. So um, there's some interesting stuff in there, I think, too. Um, uh, I'm a little surprised this didn't group, this group didn't come to surprised and not surprised um, that we didn't come to the uh, kerfuffle that Australia is having with Google and Facebook and news. Mm. Um, Google has has moved a piece on the chessboard, which startles the heck out of me, startled the heck out of a lot of people. It's like, I, the long story short, Australia is, is saying, okay, you guys got to use search engine publishing kinds of things, online publishers have to start paying news organizations for their news. Um, uh, and so Google was threatening to cut off news. Facebook actually just did it like that. And it's like, okay, well, if you're going to say or else, it's or else. Oh, fine, no problem. Um, Google's little move of a pawn was, hey, let's just make a deal and pay Fox for their news. It's like, oh my God, what what just happened? Um, thinking about it the next day after my blood pressure had gone back down to some kind of normal level, it's like, actually, if I were Google and I did that, I, I wouldn't be weirded out that it was Fox that I, I moved that pawn first. What I would be doing is I would have made some deal that Fox probably maybe isn't smart enough to see, but in a couple of years, I can start manipulating Fox because I've got a business relationship with them into being a force for neutrality or, or good instead of a force for evil upon the land. So um, whole interesting thing going on there. It's going to change a lot of stuff, uh, however this falls out. Um, the last one I mentioned real quick, uh, we mentioned growth model and it mentioned, or that reminded me of a thing that I've been thinking about, a little niggling thought I've had for, for a uh, couple months. Um, I've got this uh, crazy, crazy hypothesis, uh, um, uh, amateur sociology thing that I think about uh, feudal, um, uh, the feudal system. Um, if I look back over the past, I don't know, a couple thousand years, um, feudalism was this interesting thing that happened and it kind of took over the world. And I think one of the ways it took over the world um, was by literally outcompeting uh, the rest of the social systems. So literally feudal economies and, and feudalism got to the point where they were successful and bastardy enough to actually like go and stomp other other societies and it kind of goes on from feudalism to colonialism and and then and then you know capitalism and stuff like that but anyway i think we've literally evolved humanity out of a bunch of other social systems and ways of interacting and we still live now the humans that survived um, live with this uh, lord of the manor, manor and um, peasant structure in our heads, we're evolved, like literally, we're the, the survivors of either the lords or the serfs, one or the other. Everybody else got wiped out. The people who used to have like cool little, you know, uh, communal um, societies and stuff like that, it's like feudalism just ruled over that. Anyway, it occurred to me recently that um, if I'm a feudal lord, the way that you, one of the ways that you won against other feudal societies was essentially amassing enough serfs, feeding themselves um, subsistence level on potatoes or whatever, you, you ended up wanting more and more and more serfs. So just the mass of your feudal system versus the mass of the other guy's feudal system was a, um, a survival mechanism. And so I, I wonder, I have a wonder, I have an inquiry now, um, did this growth model where we where we assume infinite growth is a wonderful thing that fits so well into capitalism did we actually get that started when feudal lords said i have to have you know uh, 5x or hopefully 10x times as many cannon fodder serfs as the next guy so and you missed the last item on, oh that was the last item on your list uh, that is a masterful list Pete. thank you um and and narratives like the one you just put forth are one of the reasons OGM exists, partly because it's like, okay, how do I pick up on your narrative? How do I go examine the different things that convinced you that those things might be, might be happening? 
Um, how do we share those and link into one another's contexts and to Eric and Mindmeister and uh, Gil is trying the brain, but then not. And then George is all in on Rome. And like, how do we have that conversation and then layer things in? Because I, I was sitting, I was standing talking to a, a smart person about history a decade ago, I think. And he was laying on a whole bunch of stuff about the Mongols and stuff that I hadn't really heard that didn't contradict my own opinions and, and, and histories on it, but really like enhance them in different ways. And then every now and then there'd be like this jarring point of, oh shit, I don't, I don't believe that. But I just wanted to sit down and buy some beers and like go deep. But then I wanted to record and memorialize and contextualize the conversation so that it would be available to other people um, not because I think that we're right, but because we're all part of this trying to, you know, part of this story of trying to figure out why do we make this policy? Why do we do this thing over here? Why, like, why, why, why? It's based on things like what you just said, Pete. It's based on, on our, our stories. And then every now and then somebody wins, like the neoliberal point of view wins, which is its own story of how we got here. And uh, therefore, which kinds of principles ought to dominate? Uh, Neil, go ahead. Uh, two things. Not every uh, serfdom actually exceeded its carrying capacity. In Japan, they had very successful models for over 300 years. And so it comes very much down to, again to governance. But I agree with you that the self-organisational pattern is around how do we utilise this land in a way that benefits the commons, which brings us back to how do we link it with the real situation in Australia at the moment. Uh, as you know, I'm from Australia and I haven't had any news from Australia for uh, the last 24 hours, but I have seen a lot of the the serfs very concerned about the, the lack and the loss of their businesses because they were totally tied to uh, a monopoly in Facebook. But if you look a bit deeper, you recognise that the reason that uh, they paid off Fox News is because Murdoch is the elite that owns the Australian government. And so paying off Murdoch gets, gets that out of the way and we just proceed with business as usual now. Uh, Murdoch owns the Australian government because he puts so much money into it and he owns all the media. and uh, he pays off both sides. And so the legislation that was passed appears to have been passed to uh, have a very broad definition of news so that it would funnel the information, uh, the, uh, the, the funds from any use of that news back into Murdoch. Mm -hmm. So here again is the feudal system working beautifully as exactly as it's been designed. Uh, the government of the middle people and you can choose to pay them or not. Uh, Murdoch's laughing at the moment because he's getting money from one, but the serfs are now about to revolt because they've lost Facebook, which was their provider of uh, free service, which was basically taking news, some of it, in fact, most of it from Murdoch fake. So go figure, <laughs> good luck. Amazing, and these dynamics are crazy and just wait until Trump starts Trump TV as a way of trying to fund his way of keeping out of jail. <laughs> I mean, this is going to get crazier. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Boo, hiss, boo, boo. I'm reminded of Princess Bride. Everything should remind us of Princess Bride. Um, <laughs> Gil, you are, you are last, and then we'll uh, check out of the call. Yeah. Um, big gratitude for everybody, both the ones who've stayed and the ones who've had to bail. I, I needed to bail 10 minutes ago uh, for other things, but I wanted to be with you for a little bit longer. Um, I've got a long list too. I'm not going to go through it all because there's not time to do that. But a few things. Um, um, geez, where to start this? Um, I really love the kind of conversation we have here, and it's rare and delicious. And I was I posted the other day my dissatisfactions on Clubhouse because I find that it seems to mostly be a home for monologists. People would just like to talk with rooms full of people listening to them. Um, within hours of posting that, I stumbled into a couple of rooms that were actually delicious and rich and interactive conversations. So it's possible. It's not a technology limited issue. But uh, this place is a gem. And I'm uh, like, you know, Ken, what you said about the, the difficulty of coming late uh, in the queue, because there's so much to respond to. Um, but let me just touch on a couple of things and give you a little bit of news of me. Um, Doug, uh, Doug's not here anymore. Um, um, I really love Doug's talk about garden world and uh, friendships as the basis of politics. Um, and um, you know, I've heard people say lately, I think someone said on this call that there's this tension between being in these conversations and getting my work done. And I'm coming to understand that being in these conversations is a critical part of my work and getting my, not just how it helps getting my work done, but this part of the work of what I what I hear, how it affects me, what I contribute, and the richness that we develop together. So deep gratitude. 
uh, for that, and Jerry for the all the all the back end that you've been building for all these decades on, in supporting this. Thank you. Um, I was before the call. I was listening to um, some old videos of Russ Acuff. Ken, thank you for the one that you posted, the ten minute one, and then then the YouTube led me to another. Um, where he was talking about mechanistic versus systemic worldviews. And um, I just got the first few minutes, but he's basically saying, if you look at the transition from the Middle Ages to the modern era, in the middle of that is the Renaissance, which is a period of, of, of disorganization and reorganization. Uh, it's, 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 and it's, it's, huh? and, and, and murder, Jane says, and other things, but it's the mess between somewhat ordered worldviews that persist for a long time. And I would suggest that we're in that kind of period now. Uh, and we don't know what it is, and we don't know what next is, but there's a richness and a big danger there, and that's where we are. Um, uh, and it had a pandemic and lots of big bottomed people lying around on couches. All sorts of shit, yeah, yeah. Um, here we're doing something differently. We, we seem to be eliminating people, not just from agriculture and not just from commerce, uh, but even from conversation. So there was a, a Hit something on YouTube last night about a new AI that will shoot 10 minutes of video of me, have me say 300 words, and then we'll be able to construct a me that speaks any written text. So I don't have to ever talk to anybody again or go anywhere ever again. And every time I encounter this stuff, I keep on wondering why? Like, why do we want to eliminate us? What, you know, why is it us eliminating us? And of course, Marx had things to say about this in the crisis of capitalism when you, you know, when you cut costs by eliminating people and then have people who have no ability to buy the stuff that you're trying to make and sell to them, it's a little bit of a structural problem there. So I wonder about that increasingly. Um, in my own world, a couple of things. Um, um, one is that I just uh, joined the board of a energy storage company, which is a yay on the one hand, and I'm finding that, and there's more clients coming at Natural Logic for the first time in you know, well over a year. So business is cranking up, which is exciting. It's another yay. And I find myself kind of ambivalent because all that, all that remunerative work is getting in the way of the development of the work that I really want to do. So um, it's, it's annoying how that happens. It's a, it's a strange thing. Because you know, when, there's, when, when there's no income coming in and I have all the time for developmental work that I want, I'm always looking over my shoulder at how I get the bills paid. Because it's not all free yet, Jerry. I know. The, the, you know, the folks who have to lean on my house don't see the world the same way you do. Mm. And mm. but in the last week, I haven't touched the new projects at all. It's all and the headline for Gil's joining that storage company was sustainability legend Gil Friend joins. So we yeah. are graced with a legend in our they're, presence here, they're, folks. They're, they're, we, their headline cannot mind. Should we start I, calling you Legend Gil Friend? <laughs> not, no, no, that reminds me of Princess Bride, Jerry. It does, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> like everything should. <laughs> Like everything should. That's right. Um, in in the midst of work with one, we, of the sh clients, we should all have a legendary friend. Yeah. <laughs> well, you can, I have miss mine. you can have an imaginary friend or legendary. Friend. Either way, you pick it. Um, <clears throat> bringing this down to specifics, one, one of the clients I'm working with, I'm tasked to develop a kind of a white paper, big big picture strategy about how do we finance climate crisis in in a region. How do we you know how do we find the money to pay for the hundreds of billions, if not trillions of dollars that we need to both reduce climate emissions <clears throat> and to deal with the adaptation of rising seas and rising temperatures and rising fires and so forth and so forth. And I, <clears throat> I presented the draft um, to the client team the other day um, saying, you know, here's the big picture view, here are the breakdowns, here are the systemic interconnections, here are the missing pieces in the current strategies that give us enormous new leverage. And I was really intrigued because they said, well, we really want to know how do we pay for this particular project? Oh, and how did you choose that project? Did you do like, you know, did you do a strategic analysis of where the biggest bang for the buck is? No, no, we just think this is a, we think this is an interesting project. So it's, been, you know, I have a client who commissioned something systemic and seems to be in the process of projecting it in the face, in, in favor of something tactical. So I'd like to talk about that more. Um, and you know, and just sort of get the benefit of your thinking about that kind of dilemma. Because I, I imagine that others of you have encountered that before, uh, but I'm right in the middle of that. Um, um, last but not least, uh, um, multiple comments about multi-authoring platforms. 
Uh, I've got a couple of books that I want to do as multi-author books, not by me. I want to do a multi-author and I want to write them in the open so people can watch them being constructed and interact with them being constructed. So I welcome suggestions about platforms to do that, not with Markdown uh, or any clever stuff because this needs to be available to lay people who have no computer skill at all other than, you know, hitting a site and type. So um, mm -hmm. offline, I'm, I'm looking for suggestions for that. I've been looking for about two years. Which appears to be a strangely underdeveloped field. Like it's not, Yeah, yeah. this is not a fruitful field uh, as far as I can tell, so. Well, I don't, I don't think those are the same thing. Yeah. Underdeveloped, yes, unfruitful, I don't know. I think, I think it might be fruitful. I think collaborative writing is really fruitful. Yeah. I think that the tools and platforms to do yeah. so, to, to go from lots of people collaborating to a book out the other door, out, out yeah. the door I, don't, I don't see those yet. It's, it's a complex problem. Uh, it, you, you want to support people who, who don't want any fancy stuff like Markdown and you want to support, you know, highly formatted stuff. And mm -hmm. it's, it's a complex problem. It's not an yes. easy one. Gil, yeah. um, uh, the Markdown, Markdown uh, path starts at completely plain text. Sure. You don't have to, you don't have to use Markdown fanciness. Yeah. Um, so I would still advocate for um, the uh, things we could get Markdown thing. Is that called Markless? Pete, could you post um, it? Could you post that in the uh, in the persistent chat, not persistent chat, the other one? Um, post, start I, me off somewhere. Yeah, I will, and and I'd I'd love to help too. I, that's yeah, it's thanks. a I, I really want to see that more. Okay, so if you could, if you also give me a way to contact you in the chat, that would be great. I mean, I remember the old days of social text where the formatting was you know asterisk at the beginning and end of a phrase. And, and Markdown is the same thing, but. <laughs> Okay, then maybe we just do that. Yeah. But then I need the shared platform. So any any suggestions would be welcome. And la last and last but not least, uh, with regarding the whole energy story and the business in Texas, and you know some of you may have seen Bill Gates's new climate crisis book that just came out, uh, an extremely lightweight interview with him on 60 Minutes on Sunday night, just like surprisingly lightweight, just even for 60 minutes. Um, and um, the short story there is that he's you know he, he's a tech guy. Uh, doesn't understand living systems or biology is favor of a big, uh, you know, big geoengineering uh, and fundamentally set, keeps saying over and over again that we need to invent new technologies to solve these problems when we have a host of stuff, you know, at the edge and coming on to market rapidly right now, plummeting price of solar and EVs and so forth. And I find myself thinking, listening to uh, an earlier part of this conversation that, you know, that, that Bill Gates on climate, Bill Gates is to Bill McKibben, as in computer technology, Bill Gates was to Steve Jobs. That works. Smart, but yeah, but not really, hasn't really limited smart. Yeah, yeah. Um, so. Thank you, Gil. Uh, Neil, then Scott, then we're out of this call. Just doing a quick weave across a couple of things. Um, what Gil said and what Eric asked, what comes after postmodern? Metamodernism. What is metamodernism? Multi-plural or pluralistic looking at multi-perspectives. What's going to cause you the problems with the funding is the whole system's design requirement actually needs people with the complexity, the depth and the understanding of the predicament and the systemic solutions. What's going to cause you the difficulty in getting the funding? Most of the funding agencies are tied up with people like Bill Gates, which don't have that level of thinking. What's going to get you the problem with actually getting any funding from grants, including the ones Lauren's going for, will be the less conscious gatekeepers who think they're doing it because their worldview tells them this is the answer and therefore we're screwed, right? We have to get whole systems design laboratories that actually can think at this higher level of complexity. We need uh, philanthropists that actually are conscious. There must be some kids that have grown up in families that have given them 400 years of inherited white supremacist wealth that they can now recognize, oh shit, we're all fucked unless we change the, change the narrative. Where are the people that are doing this work? And if that's not the source of funding for this group, we're dead. Uh, and, also, and then Neil, you've got you got Rupert sitting in the background of all that. Yeah, you got to go around Rupert. That's why you pay him off and move on. <laughs> oh man, um, Scott. Well, as usual, not so heavy or deep for me. Um, but the idea, Gil, you were talking about, you don't you want to keep it simple, so it's mm -hmm. accessible by the most people. Okay, that means maybe Markdown is is it's too challenging. When I'm looking at that, is I'm thinking. In my perspective, when I used to play games when I was little, it was all the simple games, Parcheesi and blah, blah, blah. You know, you could learn them in five minutes, you can play them, in, but there's no replay value. Mm -hmm. 
the Euro games come along, the rule set's a little deeper. You have to learn a little bit, but now you have a game that you actually want to play again and again. Mm -hmm. And when I'm thinking about the interaction in this book, I'm thinking click, tap, swipe. Those are all computer interactions that everyone has now learned. Mm -hmm. And because of that, they're now able to do things. And I'm wondering, what is the modern minimal set? Mm -hmm. Is it actually Markdown or something like that? Is there another level that's not a lot further, mm -hmm. but it's just a little further that enables an enormously more robust way to now type a double bracket, get a link? Oh, now everybody knows that. Okay, that wasn't that hard, but you do it, you know, do it a thousand times. It's just part of how you work. Um, so that was just the thought that came to mind is that maybe there's, instead of trying to automatically say, I need to make this absolutely accessible without learning anything new. It's like, what's the next two, three, five things that you need to learn in order to open up this whole new world? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that. I, I, and I probably overstated the problem. It's not that I need anybody to wander in and be able to participate. I need you know, 15 or 20 people to be able to learn a couple of tricks and do what they need to do. To write. Sweet. Um, we have run well over time. We are almost at the top of the hour. I am very grateful for this group. Thank you for being here and for everything you've put into our, our, our little conversation here. Until soon. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you all. Bye, everybody. Bye. Somehow ending calls makes me feel peaceful, right? Yes. <laughs> it's like all of a sudden this calm of everyone leaving. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. Well, you know, it's kind of like the end of a party where there's still a, a, a couple of, or maybe there's one small conversation. Yeah, but it's not the lights on yet. It's not where they start no, no, cleaning. No, no, no. It's no, it's no, like no. before that part. <laughs> yes, exactly. That is exactly right. <laughs> so, so Eric, I, I think that did make sense to you as you said you're talking about consolidating your ideas into fewer programs, in a sense. And, yeah. and, and what I've noticed, because I've tried to do the same thing, and what I noticed is that I actually, when I flip from one to the next, I just, I kind of abandon the old one and work in the new one. And I leave some things behind, but I find that the ideas are better in mm -hmm. the new structure. Cause I had to, I had to make them fit a, a different model. I had to rebuild them using different tools. And I get that, yeah. Yeah, it just made me find the holes in it um, and so instead of what, and, and on the opposite side of that, I was also noticing that if I just stay in one program, it keeps me boxed in because mm -hmm. I start to work within the limits of the software instead of realizing yeah. that my idea can go beyond that, but I just can't draw a triangle. So I don't use any triangles because there's no triangle tool. There's a circle tool and a square tool. And yeah, but it's tool. also it's also weird how there's like certain habits that if you keep on using a certain tool, there's certain habits that get ingrained. When I come back to a tool, sometimes I use different methods of using the same tool because my thinking has changed. Mm, yeah, yeah, for sure. I definitely see that. So while I was thinking had been thinking about what is the perfect tool for this. Now I'm realizing there isn't one. It's like the paradigm thing that Vincent was saying. There are lots of different paradigms. There are lots of different tools. None of them is yeah. perfect. They're all created right. and they all have something different to offer. And yeah, I, I, I bump into the, the parts where it doesn't do what I imagined it would do and then trying to find a solution for it and then and then grinding and grinding until I find maybe a solution. <laughs> it's like, oh no, no, it's not possible. Oh damn. What I'm finding is if, if I can take the idea from one platform to the next, 
then the idea is really mm -hmm. way more important than the software. Whereas mm -hmm. before it was, I have a, I have a mind map in my master. Mm -hmm. That's the thing. And now the thing has become, no, I have a framework. It's an idea framework. It, it works in all of these different software applications. And that to me has become more valuable than this idea of building it once using mm -hmm. a radiant mind map structure or using a spreadsheet or using a wiki or, or whatever. I think if I can build it, it it's mm -hmm. just a different way of describing what am I making? Yeah. I, I'm making a, an idea set, a framework. I'm not making a mind map and mind master. I'm expressing it that way, but then I'm expressing it in a different way in a different software. Mm -hmm. I have a question for Lauren, but she's working on the fridge there. <laughs> yeah. I'm making so, a chicken pot pie. <laughs> eh? I'm making You're? a chicken pot pie. A pot pie? Yeah, it's like- a, They're um, delicious. Yeah, it's an American thing, I think. But uh, what is it? A pot pie? I just heard pot pie, but then the, yeah, the word before. Pot, pot pie. Ah, and what's the pot, pot standing for? Um, <laughs> I don't know, but it's like a, um, you're using pie crust and mm -hmm. um, a roux made of um, chicken stock and then mm. with, with vegetables and chicken in it. Ah, yeah. nice. I'm curious about that one. It just makes me think late. a bit about Gentse Waterzooi. That's like a, a Belgian dish, which is a fish dish. It's it's like a soup, a very rich soup with fish, but really nice. Okay. I sent, you a, I sent you a link that'll get you started. <laughs> okay, cool. Each, <laughs> you each learn one something of them new is, on this call. Yeah, sorry. Uh, each, each one of them is different. You know, it's, it's a very <laughs> personal thing, like a stew. You know, it has its own... Oh, right, cool. It's own I'm gonna you know, look at it. flavor and, and and love ingredients and you know all of that sort of thing. But it's uh, the the picture will give you a very good sense of of, cool. of what it is. So, so Lauren, the question that I had is, uh, when I do these calls for getting unstuck, would you like to see it as a collaboration for Kiko Lab? Absolutely, yes. Mm -hmm. hmm, cool. Yeah, for sure. So uh, I could, uh, do you have like a Kiko Lab Facebook page? Um, yeah, we never really use it because we're never on Facebook, but I, we, we do. Okay. If you want to use it, if you, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I could, but just to make the event, I guess, then, then it's really like a Kiko Lab event. Yeah, and then, uh, I mean I don't know how many people uh, we will direct you because it's not like we have a, a communications empire, but you know, if you want to do- Oh no, it's just to share, to be able to share it. In any way that I can, I'd be super happy. But I think most people are on Facebook though, right? Like they are not on there a lot maybe, but most of our OGM groups, Kiko Lab groups, most of them are on Facebook, I guess. Yes, and if anyone is on Facebook, it'd be great to have a way of interacting with them. So that would be cool. Yeah. So. I don't know. Do you know the group that Jerry made or not? On Facebook? Mm -hmm. Nope. Yeah, I'll, I'll ask him about it, I guess. I mean, I'm a, I'm a, I always respond to Facebook. I'm on there, but I don't like check things and follow Facebook groups anymore. I just... Uh... I know. Yeah. Well, I, I always have this like one or two running Facebook groups at the same time. And then that's the ones I focus on, but the rest, it's just what whatever passes in my feed sometimes. Right. Um, okay, let's do that. And um... yeah, so we're, we're trying to get everything together kind of simultaneously, you know, uh, Vincent and um, Peter have been working on a calendar system. So a lot of these things will be emerging simultaneously. And so we're getting a bunch of interns. I just found out we're getting two teams of interns to work on the grants thing. So that the, actually, the, and we're, and we're hiring professionals. So it's going to be like a real operation. 
But is it's you, it's Charles, because you're saying we are getting, is that you and Charles are getting, or is there like yeah. a bigger, uh, okay. Yeah, we're paying some um, people to actually, uh, is some good people to help us. And they have a professional grants database, which mm -hmm. with the real access to grants. Um, and so we're Very gonna nice. like professionalize the process and let everyone oh. else in on their good advice. Oh, really nice. Um, and so if you're interested, basically the concept is saying you're in Europe, but maybe your, your, some of your ideas could either like if, I don't know if you don't uh, say if you needed our organizational structure, we have a nonprofit mm -hmm. in the United States, you could use that and get access to the, a grant that normally you wouldn't even be able to access whatsoever. That's a very nice way of thinking about it. Yeah, I, I want to create a new one. I have one in Belgium, but in Holland, it's generally easier. So I want to change to Holland okay. to do a nonprofit there. Um, so let me think. I'm going to... So could you make me an admin for the Kiko Lab Facebook page, please? Uh, sure. It's just sure. to have like a parking space for the event kind of thing. And then I could still do a, another one in the system of... How about this? Why don't you ask Vincent. Charles? Because he's kind of in charge of the social media. Yeah. And, and his kids are leaving um, him tonight. And so he'll be freer than me until my husband's away now. <laughs> okay. All the kids and they're on vacation and I'm mm -hmm. sick. So it's a bad... Uh, yeah, that's a busy life. <laughs> yeah. yeah how many kids do you have again i just have the twins i only the twins okay yeah. <laughs> only mm. <laughs> only twins only in oh, stereo only. <laughs> <laughs> i only live in stereo <laughs> you don't have any um, kids right you don't seem like you have kids you already told me yeah no i don't um sherry I don't know who is recording now, actually, because the recording's still Gary? on. Oh, but it's not in the call. That's funny. That keep, keeps on going. Yeah, it'll be available forever. Whoever wants yeah, to just, hear about my pot pie. <laughs> yeah, just just to share all my secrets on there and <laughs> <laughs> people. Then, like that one person that watches until the end after the call and says, "Like, oh, what did that guy say?" <laughs> Hmm. So, yeah, so how, are you interested in our grant uh, flotilla? Yes, for sure. I am. How about you, Scott? Scott, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. I, I honestly don't even know really what that is. So, um, it, you know, you're developing a project or idea. If you want to um, get funding for grants to develop it uh, further, uh, you could do it uh, with us using the process we're co-developing and um, hmm. you know we'll be like you know um, giving feedback to each other on our writing and um, we're searching through database for relevant grants and so on and so forth. We're having chicken pot pie. Okay. Can I have some fried rice? Uh, yes, if you want to. Yeah, it smells so good. It smells good. It's pie. Um, Why not chicken? Hello. Hello. <laughs> Why not chicken without pie? You can, you can eat what you want, Sasha. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I mean, it's, it's interesting, but I, I, at the moment, I don't have any expenses. <laughs> and so there's really nothing that I would be, I, I, I don't have any like, oh, well, if I had X amount of dollars, I would do this with it relative to this project. So oh, opposite. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's... <laughs> I have the opposite as you, Scott. <laughs> really. I have like, I have, I have to find a grant that's able to pay me an amount of money that for me is like, wow. Are really going to do that? But it's at the same time, it, it seems like a normal amount of money for what I want to do. Well, see, I and I'm, I'm not thinking about it as replacing an income. Um, I don't know if that's your situation, but for me, yeah, that's just part of it, though. 
yeah it's yeah. also paying developers and um and, P and community managers i think like network builders community managers uh and um and developers are like the two kind of roles that need to be paid first in what i want to do um and i know some maybe hooks but yeah it's still challenging yeah for me on the developer side i can't think of any hmm. well it's the, the reason that i wouldn't know what to do with the developer yet is I, I have always viewed a developer as the end. Mm. So you, you bring the developer on when you know what it is that you want to uh, make. It, it's like it's like finding a manufacturer when you don't have a working prototype. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it seems to me with what I'm doing, there's no point in having a developer because I'm part of my creation process is I develop it as much as I can and then see how that works, which changes changes the framework. And that's no way to build a bridge. And to me, a developer is someone who, the ones that I've, I've only worked with one in my life actually. And this was within my work. And mm -hmm. I worked with him really, really well, better than anyone else in the company, which he told me because I told him, this is exactly what I want this to do. And then he went ahead and coded it. And everyone else said, you know, I'm kind of thinking about this workflow thing that would be really cool if this just was faster to use. That's a, a broad statement, but that's kind of how people approach it. And the same way, Scott, it's because we're graphic designers and you can just hand it off like this huh. is exactly what I want it to look like. <laughs> yeah, yes. Yeah. And, and here's here's where I want this button to go to. Yeah. And, and yeah. that kind of thing. And the developers love that because then they can just do their thing. And what I've seen is that people sometimes mistake a developer for a project manager co-creator. And it's it's yeah. really not. And if you don't have your, like, if I can't make a, an interactive wiki file, or a or a mockup or a wireframe or something that does exactly what I want, then it to me it's too early for a developer, because I don't know they're gonna they're gonna look at me and say, okay, I'm ready to go. What do you want? What do you want? Mm -hmm. And the first thing you're gonna say is, well, I'm not really sure yet. And that's what I've noticed is that that's when the relationship between the, the vision and the developer kind of break down because the, the visionary hasn't gone through the steps of saying, this is how it should function. And this is how it should be organized and, and that kind of thing. And so that's why I think for me, I'm not ready for a developer because, because I, I don't have that that um, clear set of directions yet, you know, where, okay, I've run into a technical limit. I haven't run into a technical limit. I've run into a complexity limit. So my complexity yeah. limit is for me to solve. And once I solve that, then I can say, here's, here's the specific requirements. And now a developer can look at that and say, oh, okay, I know what this is. I know how long it's gonna take me. So that, that's my own perspective on it. And even now, you know, there are no code tools. You know, Vincent is a master at no code tools. Yeah. And uh, I would I would just even do it with that as a next step before you do the hard coding. Airtable is really unique, though. It's like I've never come across something like Airtable. It, it's also got limitations that I don't like, but maybe they could be circumvented. I actually created an idea that might work where I make Airtable into kind of a, something like the brain, yeah, I don't know. I'll, I'll first have to test it. Um, I'm gonna reach out to Vincent. I like that idea of the no code tools. I wanna see what, what he yeah, has available. Yeah, you should do that. That's nice. And, um, <coughs> Yeah, there's plenty of, of it out there. He uses basically Airtable and Kumo and on some other plugins. He does, he did learn to code a bit, but uh, to make oh. his patchwork to come together, but it's 
there's I finished my my Google JavaScript training program. I, I, haven't ever, I haven't ever used it, but you know, it was it's a start. It was, yeah, it was a couple months, and so then I mm -hmm. it, it helped me because I wrote I had classes in basic and Fortran and COBOL. I mean, like hard computer languages way back in the in the uh, late eighties. But mm -hmm. you know, then I used uh, Scratch. I think it's called MIT Scratch. It's designed for kids. It's kind of like a Lego plug and play. I made a video game mm. uh, that that is still up. It still works. Yeah, really. It's okay. it's great. But it you know I I did one, so um, it, yeah. it's I I did. I don't know. I I I did one thing. So I I know how programming works. But I've never actually learned enough. Here, I'll show you. Uh, I'll send yeah, you the, the link on it. Yeah, there's something called interaction designers and information architects, which are not necessarily technical job that's, descriptions, but they that's are. That's what part I do. Yeah. Um, well, and, and Lauren has that same uh, ability as a graphic designer, right? Look on there. <laughs> yes. Um, you know, it's that it's that ability to structure the information. I'm gonna drop off almost because I feel I need my mind to rest. Yes. Okay. But um, me too. Nice to, yeah, nice so talking to you both. Glucolander I made with my son to help teach the basic concepts of diabetes, of of mm -hmm. type one diabetes because when we were in the hospital, learning about it, that's basically what it was. Okay, you've been diagnosed. Now you're going to stay in the hospital for a week, and we're going to teach you what this is and how you manage it. And the idea that that he and I had, my son and I had, was, you know, there's a lot of siblings who are wondering what's going on with their their newly diagnosed sibling, and if you could give them this video game and they could play it for half an hour they would understand the fundamentals of managing blood glucose, a except they're just playing a game. And that was the idea behind it. So. Anyway. I just look, I'm looking at the pie, pot pie re recipe <laughs> photo now. And it looks a bit like a quiche, but then everything thrown in. Yeah, it's not cheesy like a quiche. Uh. That's nice though. It looks nice. It's not, and it's not eggy. It's not, it doesn't have eggs and it doesn't have cheese. Ah, I want to make it. Crust. I love it. I, I will. I want to do that next week. Yeah, that's uh, on my to-do list. <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to leave together, too. I'll make it for you, Eric. Okay, cool. <laughs> I, I will keep you to that promise. But um, <laughs> I, I'm going to leave too. Good luck on this one. And, uh, Nice to, to talk to all of you. Bye. 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 See you later. Bye, Scott.